Welcome back. Let's go ahead and finish the last half of our last chapter of the semester. Again, this is chapter 27, the reproductive system. I just got done talking about the male reproductive system, um, the pathway of sperm during uh, development, which is the um, seminiferous tubule inside the testis to the epididymis where the mature, where the sperm mature, mature sperm, travel up through the vas deferens to the ejaculatory duct to the urethra during ejaculation. After the bulbourethral gland has neutralized any acidic urine that might be in the urethra and lubricated the urethra. And of course, during ejaculation, you also have the seminal vesicle, the prostate um, and the prostate both contributing to the fluid volume of semen. So basically the sperm leave the epididymis and combine with products secreted by both the seminal gland and the prostate in the ejaculatory duct to travel all the way down the urethra. And uh, we also talked about the corpus cavernosum being the outer spongy vascular tissue of the penis and the corpus spongiosum being um, also spongy vascularized tissue, but it is the part that is surrounding the urethra and is really designed to keep the urethra open while the corpus cavernosum engorges with blood during an erection um, so that the penis can become the copulatory organ. Okay, so that's male anatomy of the reproductive system. The female anatomy of the reproductive system, again, the parts arise from at least the external parts and some of the internal parts arise from um, basically the same place as do as the male ones do. The difference is that uh, biological or genetic females usually have a different hormone balance initiated by that X chromosome versus the Y chromosome um, leading to a slightly different pathway of development embryologically speaking. The gonads in the female reproductive system are the ovaries, the reproductive tract, um, or the, the path, or the ducts, the reproductive ducts of the female reproductive system include the uh, fallopian or uterine tubes. I guess I could start with the ovaries here. One ovary here, one ovary here the fallopian tubes or the uterine tubes, I will accept either, are the first step in the pathway of the egg on its way to the uterus. At the uterus, which is part of the reproductive tract, This whole thing is the uterus, the fundus is the outside, the lumen is the inside, the walls versus the hollow portion inside are the uterus. The cervix is specifically the part of the uterus, the, like the, uh, the neck of the uterus, if you will, that extends down into the vagina which is the last portion of the female reproductive tract. And we'll make it yellow, okay. So notice how the cervix actually extends down into the vagina there, okay. And it changes in how far down it extends throughout the cycle of the female. Um, if you use a menstrual cup, this is the part that that cup actually wraps around and catches the blood coming from the uterus. So that's where that goes. And you can see that it doesn't have anywhere to escape to. So if you're not using a menstrual cup for that reason, you can rethink that. <laughs> All right, accessory glands in the female reproductive system. So we had the the seminal vesicle, the prostate, and the bulbourethral glands in the male reproductive system. The female reproductive accessory glands include 
the greater vestibular glands, which we cannot see from this angle. These are actually um, partially external. So those are gonna actually be down here. The rest of the external genitalia include the mons pubis, the labia majora and minora, the vestibule and the clitoris, which we can see none of from this angle. So I'm going to go ahead and hold off on that here real quick. First, let's take a look at a profile view of the rest of this stuff, okay? Yeah, okay, I'm okay with that. All right, the fallopian tubes from this angle would be here on this side, but we're looking at a sagittal cross section. So we can only see the one on the other side of the uterus. So that's that one right there. The ovary that we can see, it hasn't been basically like cut out in front of us is over there. We've got the, uh, the fimbriae, which I wanted to mention also here as well, actually. The fimbriae is part of the uterine tube and it is like a little hand that reaches over the ovary. And when the egg erupts out of the wall of the ovary, the fimbriae sweep that egg up into the uterine tube. Just kind of wild to think that the that the little ovum, that little egg, is basically like hanging out in the abdominal cavity potentially if it doesn't get swept up by the little fimbriae. Kind of crazy. All right, the uterus is here. I do want to note, or I would like for you to note, that it is posterior to the urinary bladder, okay? The cervix is here, and we can see a little bit more clearly here how it extends down into the vagina, which is here, okay? And also note that the vaginal opening is posterior to the urethra, right? Here's the urethra from the urinary bladder. Here's the vaginal opening. And all the way back here is the anus, right? So you've got three points of exit or entry, if you will, here, okay? The greater vestibular glands we can see now. They are right here. So they're just, again, posterior and lateral to the vaginal opening. And we're starting, we can see some of this other stuff here now too. So we've got the mons pubis, which is basically the, um, the fleshy part that covers the pubic bone on the anterior surface. The labia majora and minora are a little bit tougher to visualize here. So the majora are the larger labia, labia being like lips. So the labia majora are the larger ones and the labia minora are on the inside. And the majora and minora are the plural forms of major or magus and minus, okay? The vestibule is the space in between the two uh, labia minora. And the clitoris is this strange little structure, which is homologous to the glans penis or the tip of the penis, which protrudes here anteriorly. So that's anterior to both the urethra and the vaginal opening. And it actually extends up into the body. 
So the part that you see from the outside is literally the tip of the iceberg. Okay, so now we can see more of the external structures of the genitalia. The greater vestibular glands are again here, lateral and posterior to the vaginal opening. You also can see now these structures right here, which is called the bulb of the vestibule. And it really just is like the fleshy part that surrounds or that is within the labia majora, okay? So uh, again, vaginal opening, urethra, the anus is back here. And look at how the little clitoris, it looks like a little penis, just kind of bizarre, right? Okay, the greater vestibular glands. The greater vestibular glands, these guys right here, they are responsible for secreting um, mucus as well as the mucosa. This is actually a mucosa that's lining the vestibule as well. They both produce uh, lubricating fluids, both in everyday life and especially in the case of the greater vestibular glands in the case of arousal. Okay, from here we can see the mons pubis right here. It's basically the fleshy part that covers the pubic bone. The labia majora are going to be here and here. And the labia minora are internal or medial to that. So they're here and here. The vestibule again is the area within the labia minora. Or between, you might say between the labia minora and the clitoris is here. Also the clitoral hood or the prepuce of the clitoris is homologous to the foreskin of the penis, by the way. Oh, it's, just, it's just this one. I don't need you to know the details about the clitoris, just where it is. Okay. All right. This, uh, all these words are exactly the same. I just wanted to show you what the rest of the clitoris looks like. And this is relatively recent. This is like past 20 years that we figured this out. So literally the part that's external that you can see is here <laughs> and the rest of it, all this yellow structure is all internal and it kind of, it basically would fit in the palm of your hand. Um, so it's that big, pretty amazing. Um, so yeah, kind of cool. All right. So let's talk about, we talked about spermatogenesis. Let's talk about oogenesis, right? This is the genesis of eggs or ova uh, as opposed to sperm, right? And of course, this happens in the gonad, which is the ovary. The process begins with a primary follicle. So basically, you have kind of the little stem cell um, or, if you will, the... Um, it's not the parent, it's not the parent cell in meiosis, but it's one of the daughter cells, but it's just one of them. So the other three become helpers and only one actually becomes an egg of the four that result from meiosis. So that primary follicle is surrounding that one uh, gamete, which is destined to become an egg. The follicle is like a support system for that proto egg. As the follicle develops, it moves around the ovary 
and we uh, refer to it as being primary when it's very small. And as it grows larger, it becomes a secondary follicle and then a vesicular follicle. Um, and then it erupts from the, through the wall of the ovary and gets captured by the fimbria, which sweep it up into the ovarian duct or the fallopian tube, which is kind of trippy. The, uh, um, the ovary you'll notice has a cortex and a medulla. Don't worry about that so much. Um, I really am mostly interested in knowing about the follicles. Um, I don't need you to be able to identify one follicle from another, except for the corpus luteum and the vesicular follicle. And I will show you what those look like right now in this cartoon, at least. So we have primary follicles here, secondary follicles. Um, the oocyte uh, is starting to develop into an egg and become a primary oocyte. The secondary oocyte uh, in, is in a um, vesicular follicle. And uh, there's another term for vesicular follicle, which is eluding me. I think it's um, Gaffian or Graffian follicle. And I don't think your text actually uses that term, but I saw it everywhere else. So you're going to see it. Um, actually, real quick, what I'm going to do here is show you what I saw here. Hang tight. It'll be worth it. This is the PowerPoint that I shared in your lab description. It's also in the to-do list, but I wanted to show you this. So this is from Lee's histology. This is an ovary. We have several follicles that we can see here. We've got like little primary follicles hanging out, secondary. This is a mature graphian vestibular follicle. Okay, so a graphian follicle just means that it's a mature one and it's about to basically erupt through the wall of the ovary and release this little oocyte into the uterine tube. Okay, so a vesicular follicle I have learned is often referred to as a graphian follicle. So I want to make sure that I have that here for you. Okay, it basically just means that it's a mature follicle. Okay. Come on, don't fail me now. All right. So the graphian follicle is going to be the largest one where you can see the little oocyte. Okay, which is basically the egg. That's the egg. Okay. Once the egg escapes the ovary <laughs> via the follicle erupting through the wall of the ovary, as you can see here. The remaining follicle is going to basically shrivel up and become the corpus luteum. Okay, the corpus luteum is important because it starts to secrete a hormone called progesterone, which is what causes the female body or the human body to think that it's pregnant. Okay, so. Once that, once that corpus luteum reaches a certain stage of maturity after ovulation, it's going to start secreting progesterone. And that is going to basically cause all of these sort of like pre or early pregnancy uh, symptoms. So it causes the, um, um, uh, why, I don't know why I can't think of any right now. 
<laughs> the annoying premenstrual stuff. Okay. So, um, gosh, I don't know why I can't think of any right now, but basically it causes the uterine lining to thicken and create a cushy, vascularized, very nutrient dense nest for that egg to burrow into and become an embryo if it meets a sperm on its way there. Okay, here is that cycle. So the monthly cycle of females goes through a menstrual phase where the lining of the uterus, which is depicted here, so this is the endothelium of the uterus. So what we call um, that lining is the functional layer of the endothelium. That functional layer, which basically just is a lot of highly vascularized tissue, nutrient rich, fluffy vascularized tissue that basically lines the entire inside of the uterus um, leading up to menstruation. During the menstrual phase, that lining gets shed, and then that is what menstrual blood is. It's all of this highly vascularized tissue and blood. Once that is all shed, the proliferative phase is basically the building back up of this lining due to a slow increase in estrogen production from the ovaries, okay? So the estrogens go up, that lining of the endothelium is rebuilt, and then the estrogen peaks and drops. That is when ovulation happens. So that is the egg leaving the ovary here and here. Same thing. This is ovulation. Let me see if I can. Make sure that you guys can see that that is same thing. That's what you're looking at there. Okay. Equals same thing. So that is the point where the egg leaves the ovary and it starts traveling through the fallopian tube. It will either meet a sperm on its way down or it will not. In the case that either way, in the case that it does or doesn't, the follicle that that ovum erupted out of will continue on and become a corpus luteum and the corpus luteum is going to secrete progesterone, which is going to increase, right, in the bloodstream to a peak here. And once, um, if pregnancy occurs, so if the egg encounters a sperm and embeds in the side of the uterine wall, this progesterone will continue to be secreted. If it does not, then the corpus luteum breaks down and stops secreting progesterone and that drop in progesterone leads to menstruation again. So if you do not have fertilization and implantation, progesterone drops off and we shed that endothelium again for the month, okay? So that is the, that's the cycle of ovulation to menstruation. You have a menstrual phase, you shed the lining, you start over, the new egg, surrounded by a follicle, matures and busts out of the ovary at ovulation due to an increase in estrogen. That estrogen is going to drop off after ovulation and progesterone will increase because the corpus luteum is going to start secreting it. It will increase, 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 and it will either stay, it'll either plateau and stay in the case of pregnancy or it will drop off in the case of not pregnancy. And it is that dropping off of the progesterone that um, basically tells the uterus to stop building the up the endothelium. So basically it's saying, no, not this time. Stop building the nest. We're gonna try again. So we shed the nest and we start all over. And that is what menstruation is. Ta-da. <laughs> So the menstrual phase is when the functional layer, which is basically from here to here in this um, microscope image is shed. The proliferative phase, functional layer is shed. 
The proliferative phase is when that functional layer is rebuilt. And uh, the secretory phase is when the functional layer is enriched. To uh, get an idea of when that is in this chart, the menstrual phase is also referred to as the, actually it's not, it's the, oh yeah, the follicular phase. It's when the, the follicles are still growing, right? As we move into the proliferative phase, estrogen increases. Oop, we're still in the follicular phase. We're still basically developing this follicle, developing the follicle. When estrogen peaks, ovulation occurs. And from there, the secretory phase uh, is corresponds to the luteal phase, which basically just means that we're making a corpus luteum and it is producing progesterone, which will either continue in the case of pregnancy or drop off in the case of menstruation. All right. I want you to know about the three phases and the functional layer of the epithelium, of the endometrium, excuse me, okay? Don't worry about the, uh, the phases. I'd rather you know more about the, um, the vesicular or again, the graphene. and the corpus luteum, which is going to be what is secreting, secreting that progesterone um, that causes the endometrium to enrich and then shed when it drops off. Okay. All right, the breast is part of the female reproductive anatomy um, because it's used to nourish infants, right? Your breast tissue is anterior or superficial to your pectoral muscles. So it lies on top of the pectoral muscles. It is consisting of um, adipose tissue, lots of fat tissue, as well as mammary glands, okay? So you have multiple lobes of mammary glands, which are basically just modified sweat glands that are modified to create milk instead of sweat. The modified sweat glands, the mammary glands are going to um, terminate in a duct and all of these ducts will basically open at the nipple, okay? So these are all different, these are all basically lobes of the mammary glands the ducts of the mammary glands will open at the nipple. And surrounding the nipple, you have the areola, which is a, a more highly pigmented area of skin that basically acts as a, like a target for the infant actually, um, which is kind of interesting. And uh, the skin is very delicate there. So the areola has sebaceous glands, which if you remember from part A, produce sebum, which is basically like oil, which prevents the nipple from becoming chapped um, from feeding the baby, which would suck. Okay. Um, and if you're wondering, males and females both have areolas and nipples because it basically would be too much work to uh, remove something than it is to build something, uh, evolutionarily speaking. So basically um, it comes with a package um, <laughs> and it's not hurting anything. So there's no point in, um, there's no point in expending like evolutionary energy getting rid of something that's not doing any harm if it stays. So it's basically, it's part of the package of being human. Um, but in females, in embryo embryological development, if you're exposed to more um, of certain hormones, you develop mammary glands um, and breast tissue or more breast tissue than if you are exposed to the hormones 
due to having an X and a Y chromosome. So pretty interesting there. All right, the female sexual response is actually fairly similar to a male's. You've got a parasympathetic and a sympathetic um, portion. Oh, I actually forgot to complete this. So let's do it together. That's embarrassing, I missed a whole page. So instead of ejaculation, because females don't do that, we've got, oh, that's fine. Well, the parasympathetic response is very similar, right? So you have arterioles that dilate and cause for tissues that are homologous to the, um, the tissues of the penis, of the body of the penis that are actually going to also engorge with blood. So this actually includes the, uh, the labia majora and minora and the clitoris. So these things are going to engorge with blood. The wall, the inner wall of the vagina will also engorge with blood. Um, so you have that in common. The sympathetic nervous system um, does result in orgasm, which is, oh, why am I not able to do this? That's fine. This is what we're going to do. I'm going to write it down. Okay. Results in orgasm, which is not necessary for conception. but it does cause some important muscle contractions that can propel the semen and the sperm, therefore, to where it needs to go, which is basically from the vagina up the walls, around the head of the cervix, into the cervix and into the uterus and up into the fallopian tube. So the ideal place for an egg and a sperm to meet is actually in that first one third of the fallopian tube, believe it or not. So that's a long way for sperm to have to go. Sperm actually don't even start swimming until they reach the vagina. So it is an acidic environment. And while the acid may be detrimental to sperm, it actually also activates them to swim for the first time, which is kind of awesome. So once the sperm hit that interior of the vagina, they start swimming and uh, upon orgasm, female orgasm, you're going to have muscle contractions of the vagina and the uterus, which will help to propel the sperm up to where it needs to go in the fallopian tube to reach an egg, if the egg is there, right? Okay, I'm gonna add to this, the labia and the vaginal wall. Um, engorge with blood. Okay. All right. So, male and female perineums. Um, you probably have heard this term before the perineum. This is referring to basically everything going on like directly between the legs. So it actually involves a lot of um, skeletal muscle uh, in this region. Uh, in the case of females, it includes this um, diamond shape here. So from basically the um, where the labia majora meet, which is actually a little bit anterior to the clitoris and back behind the anus. Uh, and then basically everything in between. So including the entirety of the vulva and all the structures inside of this, like in this inside of that region. Okay, so not like deep inside of the body, but this surface region. And in males, it is similar. So we basically have like the point of the coccyx to 
the basically the pubic synthesis that is the perineum okay and here's my favorite part of reproductive anatomy the homologous structures so in a developing embryo you have the genital tubercle and the genital tubercle is going to depending on what hormones it's exposed to either develop into a glands penis which is the tip of a penis or it's going to turn into a glands clitoris which is the tip of the clitoris right the um labial labia scrotal swelling will as you might suspect by its name either turn into the scrotum or it will turn into the labia which is kind of amazing the urethra of the penis becomes the labia minora the inside of the labia minora in females and the corpus spongiosum which is the actual the um that vascular tissue that surrounds the urethra in the penis becomes those bulbs of the vestibule, which are inside of the labia majora, which is pretty cool. You should know what all of these things are because we've already talked about them, right? Um, and then of course, you can have intermediate situations upon birth, right? So indeterminate sex, or you can have what appears to be determinate sex on the outside, external genitalia compared to internal genitalia, which may not actually match. But generally speaking, depending on which hormone you have more of in the embryonic environment, testosterone or no testosterone, depending, which depends on whether or not you have a Y chromosome, you end up with a different pathway for these same structures to develop. Pretty cool. Um, here is another picture of the um, different parts of what ends up being the penis compared to what ends up being the clitoris, right? The glands penis and the glands clitoris should be at the very end there. But again, similar. And some stats on the differences between male and female gametogenesis. Um, for a male, it takes about 74 days to go from a stem cell or one of those parent cells through meiosis to a mature sperm. For a female, it can take 13 to 50 years. So basically from um, literally before females are born, they start making eggs, which is kind of amazing. So those eggs are starting to develop in the ovary from before birth. And then that process continues until midlife, about 50s, um, menopause, right? And results in less than 500 eggs total. Whereas in males, it takes about 74 days to make a sperm, but you don't start making sperm until you hit puberty but you still make over a trillion sperm over a lifetime. Pretty amazing. One parent cell in meiosis in males leads to four gametes, four equal gametes, four sperm. Not the same, not they're genetically distinct, but four sperm. And in females, those four resulting gametes will be four, will be three polar bodies or basically kind of like helper cells and one egg. And that's part of the reason why females make so few gametes, relatively speaking. You've got a lot more complicated stuff happening um, with egg production since you have a lot more going on in the body of the egg compared to in the body of the sperm. So eggs have all of the other components of a full body cell. So everything that you end up with um, in all of your body cells that you need to have. So like the, um, the endoplasmic reticulum, all of your vacuoles, your centrioles, like all of these important organelles, those came with the egg, those came from mom. And the sperm only has the nucleus, which is basically the payload. You have mitochondria to propel the tail, right? 
and then you have the tail and that's it. So it's literally this nucleus of mitochondria um, and a flagellum. Whereas the egg has everything else. So there's a lot more that can go wrong there. Um, and as far as other accessory cells that help with the process of gametogenesis in males, you have a sustentocyte, which is a cell that sustains the sperm cell as it develops. And then you have your little granulosa, your um, polar bodies that all of these that come together to form the follicle that support one oocyte um, on its way to ovulation. Pretty amazing. So that explains the, um, on an evolutionary, from an evolutionary perspective, it explains female choice um, since females have more at stake um, per sexual encounter, they um, have to be more choosy about their mates, right? And that goes for most animal species, not just humans. All right, disorders of the reproductive system, and then that's it. This is the end. So uh, <laughs> we've got a lot of uh, sexually transmitted infections, right? Um, the <laughs> The PowerPoint that I was um, like working off of for this had lots and lots of photos. And if you guys want to see photos, <laughs> you can Google these things. Um, but I figured I wouldn't go through a slideshow of um, horrifying photos. I'm not here to scare you straight. Um, but it is interesting to look at if you've got a morbid curiosity and um, are interested in that type of thing. But uh, most uh, bacterial or sorry, most sexually transmitted diseases or infections are bacterial in nature, which means that they're relatively easy to treat, especially early on. So some of the most common ones like chlamydia, gonorrhea, bacterial infections, not really that big a deal unless you let it get too far. Um, so Syphilis too, if it's early enough, you can just treat it with an antibiotic, not a big deal. Um, this kind of speaks to, I guess I will have one PSA, which is get tested, go get your yearly or semi-annual checkup and get tested for these things. Because if for some reason, somehow you ended up with it, most of the stuff is, the most common stuff is very easily treatable, not a big deal. Um, herpes is viral. There isn't a cure for it, but there are medications that can control outbreaks. And it's also very good to know if you have it so that you can uh, be aware of that and your partners can be aware of that. There's two separate viruses for oral and genital herpes. So um, a cold sore doesn't mean that that person has genital herpes. They have HSV1, not necessarily HSV2. Genital warts is also viral, and it's caused by the human papilloma virus, which there actually is a vaccine for, um, but you need to get the vaccine before you are exposed. So they basically, they generally give the vaccine to girls around the age of 12, 13, um, before they are sexually active um, to prevent human papilloma virus infections. Um, and this is important because human papilloma virus is also very closely correlated to cervical cancer. Um, like 70% of cervical cancer um, came from HPV. So if you come down with HPV, which is also very, very common, then you also need to be aware of cervical cancer. And cervical cancer is detected again by a pap smear. So again, go get your well women checkup and make sure that you don't have uh, cervical cancer, right? Um, candidiasis is basically a yeast infection. Um, vaginal yeast infections are super duper common and happen because of an imbalance of bacteria and yeast in the vagina, which can happen if you are like messing around with stuff down there. So you've got spermicides, you've got um, douches, um, soap even, just soap. If you get a lot of weird stuff up there, then you're gonna disrupt that balance. Um, and you're gonna end up with either a bacterial infection or a yeast infection. And either one is no fun. So leave it alone, <laughs> leave it alone. Don't, don't be douching, all right? Don't be doing that. Um, 
trichomoniasis is actually caused by a protozoan, but it is treatable. There is a medication for treating trich. Crabs are actually pubic lice and they're just, they're like little, they're little bugs, they're little parasites. So you can treat that by, uh, by treating the area. Um, and then HIV AIDS, of course, is caused by the retrovirus um, and it is life threatening to the max if it um, moves into immunodeficient, human immunodeficient, ugh, if the human immunodeficiency virus has um, infected your body and it goes into what they call full-blown AIDS, which is basically the immune system attacking itself or breaking down entirely, um, then you are basically trying to keep from getting any infection at all because any infection, any cold, any flu could be life-threatening. Um, so of course that's the big one and you know possibly the biggest reason to get tested. PID, pelvic inflammatory disease. You've got these warnings on your boxes of tampons to not leave it in there because pelvic inflammatory disease is actually very, very serious. Chronic pelvic inflammatory disease can lead to cervical cancer as well. It's caused by either um, a, 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 an infection localized inside of the vaginal vault or if um, something like punches through or you end up with an infection in the uh, peritoneum surrounding the um, uterus, you can end up with pelvic inflammatory disease, which is very life-threatening. It's basically a systemic infection at that point. Testicular cancer is, uh, um, it's a rare form of cancer, but it is the most common form of cancer for young men. So like between the ages of 35 to 50, according to your textbook. Um, so get checked for testicular cancer. If you feel a lump, get it checked out. Same thing with breast cancer. If you feel a lump, get it checked out. Uh, breast cancer affects one in eight women. So it's very, very, very common. Um, it's more common if you uh, um, are exposed to additional estrogen. Um, so um, hormonal, some hormonal birth control um, can be a problem. Um, and then uh, hormone replacement therapy after menopause um, can also be a problem. Um, and uh, there's a genetic factor as well. So you can actually get tested to see if you have the, um, the gene that makes you susceptible to a certain type of breast cancer um, and get that taken care of because um, it's because um, life is precious. It's not worth not taking care of it. Prostate cancer is the most common cancer in men. One in six males are affected by it, um, but it is a slow growing cancer. They say that more men die with it than die of it. So. Um, it's usually a watch and wait situation with, with, um, with prostate cancer, but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't get checked. Um, and I know, I know my husband at least hates, <laughs> hates all of these checks uh, for good reason. We all do, but um, doesn't mean that you shouldn't do it. And then of course, cervical cancer um, is detected by pap smear. So again, get checked, all of these things. Do your yearly or at least semi-annual wellness exam, get it out of the way and know, you know, it's better to know. And that my friends is my final PSA of the semester of the final lecture of the final chapter of the semester. So thank you for joining me. <laughs> Don't forget on Thursday, make sure that you have checked out our um, lab description, that you have your worksheet ready that you um, have looked at the PowerPoint with our lovely um, histology slides that you can kind of get an idea of what you wanna be looking for with the histology slides. Um, and then we will, next week, we will have our final lecture exams or lecture exam four, I should say, not the final. We'll have lecture exam and lab exam four, which will cover the urinary, digestive, and reproductive systems. And then our last week will be dedicated to reviewing and to the finals. 
So we actually have a lecture and a lab final. They will be cumulative, but they will be very um, overview broad based. And I promise that I will have a study guide for you um, for that um, by the end of this week. Okay, so that's what I got for you guys. Also, don't forget to do your discussions because they are worth a lot. Um, and there is an extra credit point available there. So go check it out. And of course, as always, let me know if you have any questions. We will be having a review session um, a week from tomorrow um, and then another one before the finals. So we'll have plenty of time to review um, and uh, bring your questions on Thursday too for the lab, our last lab together um, where you have an opportunity to ask questions. So bring your questions um, and I will see you guys there. All right, have a great couple of days and I will see you on Thursday. Bye-bye.